Dear Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you're ready, over to you. Thank you so much. And um, folks, I'm going to screen share. Um, and I hope you see this now. Um, and I do want us to have a little fun today because we are approaching Halloween. So um, the talk I'm about to give has the title you see chasing away evil a halloween tradition but perhaps i could have called it sweeping away evil come on let's get the sweeping there we go um and it you know how do you do that how can evil be swept away well uh it used to be new york was new amsterdam um and People there once spoke Dutch, and the word for evil is uvel, E-U-V-E-L, um, similar to the German uvel. And for all of you who are speech artists or eurythmists out there, why do you think the oo sound is part of this word evil? Well, we won't answer that, but the tradition apparently originated, that is the a tradition Halloween, with the ancient Celtic festival. And it looks like it, you should pronounce it Samhain, but apparently it's pronounced Sahin. When people would light bonfires and they would wear costumes to ward off ghosts, Sahin was a commemoration of the dead. The spirits of the departed were believed to visit their kinsmen in search of warmth, good cheer, as winter approached. In the 8th century, Pope Gregory III designated November 1st as the time to honor all saints. So you all know about this, All Saints Day incorporated some of the traditions here. And the evening before meaning All Hallows' Eve became Halloween, of course. And over time, Halloween has evolved into a day of spooky activities, trick-or-treating, jack-o'-lanterns, putting on costumes and gathering treats. So All Saints' Day celebrates the saints, as we said on November 1st, and then All Souls' Day, you know, they have to keep coming up with new days, now honors all our departed ancestors on the 2nd of November. So I think you can feel that there's a little bit of this mood towards what's trying to call a Michaelmas festival in all of this. And of course, Halloween would not be complete without some witches, whatever their age, coming to one's door for trick or treat. And I hope you all have your trick or treat basket already. I've got mine right over here. Oh, it's been shrinking recently. Anyway, so during Lemuria, if we'll jump into some anthroposophy now, the moon was separated from the earth. This caused an androgynous humanity to become separated, separated into sexes. When a body that was less earthly, that is the female body, um, found itself better able to maintain a natural clairvoyance as humanity in general descended from life in a body of air and warmth into a body developing solidity. Later in evolution, our consciousness descended to be fully contained within the physical realm. But the physical bodies of women did not descend as far into the physical as their male counterparts. They were the first to be the intermediaries between spiritual beings and the earthly human beings of a tribe. They were the priestesses. They managed the temple lore. Much later, a time came in the fourth century when human evolution had to allow the spiritual world to completely withdraw so that the karma of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil could be redeemed. Freedom had to be developed. Clairvoyance had to come to an end. With time, the priest supplanted the priestess, 
whose capacities became relegated to other things like witchcraft. Since the mystery of Golgotha, Christ has been with the earth. Vision of this sun spirit was possible for us even into the fourth century because up to then, we were still intimately united with our etheric body. Our etheric body was, well, loose from our physical body, enabling us to behold the Christ after image in the sun, the after image, even though Christ was then already with the earth. We are now at the very beginning of the loosening, once again, of our etheric body from our physical. Our soul had become an emptied soul during the 4th through the 12th centuries. Beginning in the 15th century, it has become filled with a multitude of dead mathematical and me mechanical ideas. To this foundation, something new must be added, namely the inner light that can now be found within our higher ego. For this to progress, all group isms must yield to our budding individuality. Racism, nationalism, genderisms, all must go. The sex of the physical body we know is the opposite of the sex of the etheric body. Since 1899, the etheric body has been loosening from the physical body. As our etheric body loosens, there will be individuals who will become more and more aware of the sex of both their physical and their etheric body. Since these have the opposite sex, this will be, of course, confusing to many who don't know about spiritual science, which is, of course, most people. We might ask, was Abel, that is of Cain and Abel, a female? This might sound weird, but not at first. Cain and Abel first existed during a time before humanity had a physical body that could stand upright. Humanity was still androgynous in the time when the lineages of Cain and Abel began. But these two lineages, along with the lineages of Adam and Eve, continued through the separation of, of, of moon and earth that led to the separation of the sexes. Subsequently, all four of these lineages became both male and female. Later, when the sons of God, that is the male offspring of the Abel lineage, found the daughters of men, that is of Cain, to be fair and took from them wives, even though God had told them not to do this, the results were the Nephilim of Atlantean lore. Rudolf Steiner indicated that the Cain gesture birthed Freemasonry while the priesthood derived from the Abel gesture. These have opposed each other. Ancient initiates knew that a time would come when the separation of the sexes would end. And since the male body's larynx changed at puberty, it was deemed by Masonic initiates to be an indication that in the future, when procreation return to being androgynous, that the future androgynous body would not be through the female body, but through the male body. That is, procreation would continue through the spiritualized male larynx, speaking forth the future human. <sighs> this has led to much misunderstandings, even amongst us anthroposophists. Sexual procreation will end by the year 5700 when humans will no longer evolve to reach puberty. But to be like God and use the word to speak forth a new human, this is not to happen until we reach the level of the archive, today's archive, 
when the spiritual larynx that our ego will build as part of spirit man on the future planetary condition called Vulcan, then this spiritual larynx will be able to speak into existence humans, but that will be the humans of Vulcan. On Venus, we'll be able to do this for animals. Well, animals in the condition that they'll be at that time. And on Jupiter, we'll be able to do this for plants in the condition that they will be on Jupiter. In the sixth epic, that's the one after the one we're in now, um, so after the year 8,000, some ascended initiates will be able to do this, sort of speak forth out of their ascended state, new plant forms. The Freemason saw it this way. Abel offered the sacrificial animal, the sacrificial lamb, perhaps, thereby offering from what he had, well, let's put it this way. He had done nothing to produce. He offered that which came into existence independent of him. Cain, on the other hand, sacrificed what he had labored to do, what he had won from the fruits of the earth by tilling the soil. What he sacrificed needed human skill, human knowledge, and human strength. Cain's sacrifice demanded comprehension of what one had done. All this is based, in a spiritual sense, upon freedom. But the cost of freedom was to endure the intellect's guilt of killing, first of all, the living thing which had been given by nature or by divine powers, just as Cain killed Abel. So our value, can you go on mute? Yeah. Um, so Steiner comes up with a very interesting expression. Through guilt lies the path to freedom. And I'm going to ask here, can we get to real freedom without also walking the path that where we are met with evil. So when a Freemason built a temple, you would find it to be a work of wisdom, beauty, and strength, and sold into the inanimate kingdom and born out of human freedom and brain work. As a final comment on Cain and Abel, I should mention that the builder of Solomon's temple, Hiram Abiff, learned that he was to karmically heal this guilt through those who would be able to merge these two streams in the future. Now, Hiram reincarnated, and according to Rudolf Steiner, as Lazarus. The public initiation of Lazarus brought about the merging with the recently beheaded John the Baptist. So Lazarus took on the name John. The Hierophant, Jesus Christ, had also been the product of a fusion of the Luke and Matthew Jesus boys. So I think there's lots here that we need to probe to understand our relationship to evil. But let's go back to those delightful witches and ask, were they misunderstood or are they really evil? Long ago, most societies worldwide focused on the male and rendered the female to motherhood. Warriors winning wars was key to tribal su survival. The priestess does not fully disappear during this transition time, however, but she then became associated with old pagan ways, luciferic ways, and hence evil ways from about the fourth century on. Soon the name witch became associated with evil spiritual aspirations, a woman who could summon spirits or speak with spirits or fly with out-of-body experiences 
was condemned to be burned when society sought to replace pagan ways with the new intellect that came you know, during this last cultural age and gave to us both materialism and the sense of the I am. This was carried by the Roman version of Christianity. They felt justified in brutally conquering the old ways for the new. For them, it was a battle of good versus evil. So there is evil in the world and in each of us. We should ask, how did it get there if God created this world? Every hallowed eve, we try to drive away evil and to cleanse society and ourselves so that we can properly celebrate All Saints Days. Have we ever been successful at this? So to the philosophers among you, that's probably each of you, did God create evil? Why would an all-good, all-loving God do this to us? Is there an evil God that rivals and limits God? Was this creation because God was challenged by his drinking buddy to a game to see who could sway the most humans to their side? Is evil an equal to God? Or is God totally aware of evil and its purpose? How could there be a tree of knowledge of good and evil if evil was not already in existence? Did we, by eating this fruit, take evil into us? If God created our physical body, then why do some bodies have defects and succumb to illness? Is God's creation imperfect? And can we make it better? If we can do better, should we? Where do we find evil? In spirits outside of us humans, right? In spirits inside us as well? Have you known someone who was evil? Do I have evil lurking within me? The beings who permeate, I'm going to quote Steiner here, the beings who permeate the astral body and make it unfree are called demons. Your astral body is always interpenetrated by demons and the beings you yourselves generate through your true or false thoughts. They are of such a nature that they gradually grow into demons, these thoughts. There are good demons generated by good thoughts. There are bad thoughts. Above all, those that are untruthful generate demonical forms of the most terrible and frightful kind, and these interlard the astral body. The etheric body is permeated by beings from which man must free himself. These beings are called specters or ghosts. And finally, permeating the physical body, there are beings known as phantoms. Besides these three classes, there are yet other beings, spirits who drive the ego hither and thither. The ego itself is also a spirit. In actual fact, we have this spirit to work upon what I just showed you there, the astral, etheric, and physical to create for itself in the future what Steiner called um, spirit self, life spirit, and spirit man. So let's ask the question, how do each of us experience evil? Can we agree on what evil is? When something important was destroyed, was that evil? Well, 
each of us destroys what we eat, whether it's animals or plants. Does that make us evil? Moreover, within us is a center wherein we destroy matter. This capability was necessary for us to develop thinking. Okay, maybe evil must be an immor immoral deed, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, could an amoral deed also be evil? What about selfishness? Well, is mere vanity therefore an evil? Don't we need to go through selfishness to build a strong ego? Some theologians have defined evil as the absence of good. If so, is apathy evil? Is this what the Bible means by lukewarm? What about greed or fear? or hatred, or doubt. Modern materialism, quoting Steiner, has arisen out of fear to descend into one's inner depths. Fear to a descend into our own inner depths. Rudolf Steiner also offered this concerning hatred. As fire is avoided by our hand, so do the dead avoid a person who is capable of hatred. For hatred works on the dead like fire. To come into conscious relation with the dead, we must be able to make ourselves independent of personal sympathies and antipathies, just like the dead are. Hatred is something which enters into the human soul from a deeper world of reality. In the cosmos, this hatred is something which differs greatly from what it is in the human soul. In the cosmos, hatred is a power without which individualization could never happen. Otherwise, there could be no separate identities. All matter is a product of cosmic hate. Wow, that's Steiner. <laughs> if an oriental sage of earlier times who had been initiated into the mysteries of ancient East were to turn his glance towards modern Western civilization, he might perhaps say to its representatives, you are living entirely in fear. Your whole mood of soul is governed by fear. All that you do as well as all that you feel is saturated with fear and its reverberations affect the most important moments of life. And since fear is closely, closely related to hatred, so hatred plays a great part in your whole civilization. Well, where then is evil? Oh, in the interior of the earth, right? Well, many have wondered that, and I've wondered, is this the concept of hell slipping into anthroposophy? The initiated teachers in olden times knew that all mysteries were open in the whole wide world, save only the mysteries of the interior of the earth. The Greek initiates, for instance, were aware of the spiritual beings in the interior of the earth, and they called them, in their mythology, the Titans. But Christ, Christ was the first of the upper gods to learn to know the interior of the earth. That is an important fact. The Christ, because he was buried in the earth, brought knowledge to the upper gods of this region of which before they had had no knowledge. And this secret that the gods too undergo evolution, this secret Christ communicated to his initiate pupils after his resurrection. The secret Paul also learned through his initiation that he experienced outside Damascus. What stunned and shook Paul to his depths of his being was the knowledge that the power that had formerly been sought in the sun had now become united with the powers of the earth. Johanna Kaiserlink, in Birth of a New Agriculture, 
recorded this exchange. She asked Steiner, is the interior of the earth made out of that gold which comes from the hollow cavity of the sun? In other lectures, Steiner calls this negative or counter space. So, and she asked further, is it destined to return here? And Steiner answered, yes. The interior of the earth is of gold. And yes, the sun will return. And he also said, the kernel of the earth consists of golden fire around which a dark girdle is cast, the smoke of the mineral kingdom. Here in the center of the earth is where Hiram Abiff found Cain. He was led there spiritually. Here too is the activity of the first hierarchy. Yahweh's rulership extends to the warmth through air to water, but not into the solid earth element. So Yahweh took what was not his creation, the cosmic dust of the earth, to form mankind. We can ask, because the sacrifice of Cain did not was not accepted by Yahweh, did this lead humans to evil? And if so, doesn't that make Yahweh complicit in this evil? Does this all change? The human body form remains although all cells are replaced in seven years. Because of Lucifer, the body had to become mineralized. From old Saturn, we have our phantom physical body. It is invisible. What we see is the filling out of the phantom by the mineral kingdom. Our phantom must endure to become Atman, or spirit man upon Vulcan, but our physical body as we know it will cease to be by the year 6000. The phantom goes with us when, if we ascend, during the, that seventh post-Atlantean cultural age. This visible physical body came about with the removal of the moon, and it must cease before the return of the moon around the year 8,000. So, what is hell? This might surprise many of you, but there is no such place in the New Testament. The parable of Lazarus and dies from Luke 16 depicts a wicked man suffering fiery torment in what is called Hades. This could also apply to the fiery torment one experiences in Kamaloka when one experiences their past life through the soul of others. Such fire cleanses one's soul. Often, a new anthroposophist seeks to find hell because of prior religious concepts carried forward into anthroposophy. From G.A. 266, Rudolf Steiner offers this advice. We seem to go through a fiery oven in which everything luciferic is burned. And yet this fire of divine wrath, which is really love. Once one has become aware of this happening, one tells oneself, thank God that I'm being punished and have to experience God's wrath, for it burns up in me what shouldn't be there in me anymore. Often the eighth sphere is thought to be anthroposophy's equivalent of hell. We will not have time to go into this mm -hmm. carefully nor thoroughly, but this too is inaccurate. There will be this eight sphere. It already exists in, in many respects. It will be like a moon for the Jupiter phase of cosmic evolution. It will have a purpose, especially for what we sometimes call laggard beings 
from Earth. So, Andrew, are you telling us that there is nothing that is definitely evil? Well, I'd say that the Antichrist must be a clear example of evil. Rudolf Steiner names this being from the Hebrew letters used to form the number 666 as Sora. And you can see here how that's done. And he drew this figure to represent the two horns of this beast and his barb. Rudolf Steiner did speak about a rhythm of appearance or influence that Sorat wishes. That rhythm was to have been every 666 years. So it would be continuing in 1332, 1998, 2664, and so forth. Rudolf Steiner does speak about the year 1332 as a time when Sorat worked through King Philip IV when he destroyed the Knights Templar and brought to humanity through this the greed for gold and having that desire rather than the desire for God. Many have pointed to 1998 as another year of inspiration for Sorat, especially in the field of technology, with the founding of companies such as Google, PayPal, VMware, Nintendo, Newsmax, and Lucasfilms. But what about this year 666. Well, Steiner describes this as a kind of problem. And the first problem is that we look at time as a time line, something linear. Rudolf Steiner describes how events are at the surface, but beneath this are different streams that can affect what comes to the surface. And what Sorat had intended for 666 was offset not only by the mystery of Golgotha, but also by Islam. Sorat had intended to use 666 as a time to bring a stop to human evolution. Oddly, to do so, Sorat planned to end consciousness of the spirit by bringing to mankind way too early while we were entering materialism, the ability to develop the consciousness soul. What was destined to be in the middle of the fifth post-Atlantean cultural age would be brought to mankind too early. A cultural age, as you all know, is 2,160 years. So 180 years after its start would be its middle. Thus, our current age, which began in 1413, would have its middle in 2493. Sora sought to disrupt human evolution by advancing what is to come in 2493 too quickly. So in 666, Sora wanted to gather the great minds and materials to then incubate geniuses and amazing advancements. The great achievements of the Greco era, the libraries and schools set up by Alexander the Great, the mystery centers, even the Dionysian Christian mystery center in Athens. These were all closed as pagan, as anti-Christian during the fifth and sixth centuries. And their teachers were driven out of Roman Christendom and fled to the east were near Baghdad, a great learning center called Gandhi Shapur welcomed them. Baghdad subsequently became the cultural center of the world by the ninth century. And when the Eighth Ecumenical Council took place in 869, like in Baghdad with Islam, the spirit was banned. So the influence from Baghdad spreads all across Northern Africa into Spain and across Asia. Islam had the spiritual task to counter this impulse of Sorat. Islam began in 610 AD. Islam soon conquered Baghdad, but try as it might, it did not destroy this impulse from Sorat. It subdued it to some extent, but 
human temptation led to an incorporation of it, resulting in that high culture of Islam as it spread. Baghdad was sacked on the 29th of January in the year 1258. All of its culture, its libraries, its art were cast into the rivers. Sorat had turned his attention to stopping the impulse coming from the Templars, and that he accomplished in 1332. So here are five of the many sources for more information on this very important topic. Some of you might say to a Catholic, you have just one devil, but we anthroposophists, we have three. For us, it is three times more difficult than for you Catholics. I mean, just when you have a handle on how to deal with, say, Araman, Lucifer comes along to tempt you back into evil. It seems to never end. And now, as if two devils weren't enough, good God, now we've got a third, the Azuras. Hey, according to some well-meaning students of spiritual science, these Azuras are worse than the other two combined. No wonder the good but weary anthroposophical soul wants to say, hey, gods, I give up. This is crazy. But when we realize that I might not graduate from Earth, that I might become a laggard, <gasps> then I might find some sympathy for these devils. You see, each of them were laggards. Some from old moon, some from old sun, and some from old Saturn. Each has a being high up in the hierarchy who would like to see them redeemed and brought back into the fold before Vulcan evolution is completed. You see, by the time old moon was about to begin, the Godhead could see that we, the earth humans, would be a rather wimpy angel if things had continued on uninterrupted. So this Godhead directed some of the mites, also known as dynamis, to become spirits of hindrances. These adversely commanded mites were not yet evil in themselves. <laughs> On the contrary, they were the great promoters of development, promoting it, though, through the storms and so on they produced. But they were the breeders, if we can call them that, of evil. For out of the storms that they produced, evil gradually arose. Thus we see that because those mites were given certain orders, we humans first received the possibility of reaching our goal by our own strength, a thing which even the highest seraphim cannot do of themselves. This is the important point out of Steiner's Anthroposophy. The seraphim, cherubim, and thrones cannot do otherwise than follow the immediate impulses given them by the Godhead. The beings of the second hierarchy, they can't do otherwise. A certain number of the mites were ordered to oppose so that these mites also, who as it were, threw themselves into the way of development, could not do otherwise than to follow the orders of the Godhead. What is called the origin of evil, they could but perform the will of the Godhead, who by means of evil wishes to develop the more powerful good. The first who had the possibility of being evil, therefore, were the angels when they were on the human stage of old moon. Thus, all of the beings of the hierarchies, except for 
some of the angels are beings who are absolutely unable to do otherwise than to follow divine will. We know that what we perceive of the physical realm is a kind of illusion. Although we don't see them with our the spiritual world uses elemental beings to accomplish their work upon the physical realm. These can be called a kind of offspring of the beings of the hierarchies. Each of the ethers and each of the elements, that is fire, air, water, earth, have their respective elementals, salamanders, sylphs, undines, gnomes, Sometimes they're called nature spirits. We might ask, can we humans create elementals? Indeed, we do. When we ensoul our thoughts into computer devices, we are enchanting elementals into such devices. Only these are, in our times, demonic elementals. Remember, good and bad demonic. Whenever we construct something using wrong concepts, we are deploying demonic beings into what we create. Huh. Are we messing things up or is this part of our cosmic development to become the 10th hierarchy? Are we sort of babes at this point playing with our capacities to be developed? Today, in the fifth post-Atlantean cultural age, we are at our deepest in matter, and we are creating terrible demonic forces for the next cultural ages. Where we, where we transform ancient sacred things into physical, mechanical things, we work below the physical plane. The future underworld will be what we create. Rudolf Steiner adds, quote, one must be clear about the fact that the evil forces of Earth evolution must also be included in our human evolution. During the future time, when they have to be overcome, humans will have to use enormous strength to transform the evil and the demonic into the good. But our strength will grow as a result because evil exists to make our strength like steel by having to overcome it. So all evil must in turn be melted into the good and it will take inner fire and love to do so. To, so, what about technology? Let me read a couple quotes from recent journals. One said, 50% of AI researchers think there is a 10% chance or more that our inability to control AI will make us go extinct. And a news article just yesterday said that OpenAI, that's one of the companies making AI products, open AI team tasked with, so they, they formed a team that is tasked to stop AI from triggering a nuclear Armageddon. You know, it's surprising, but you would think that these companies, before they deploy these things, will make sure such issues don't arise. But in fact, there is a race which is says the earlier you beat your competition to a market, the bigger the market share you will attain. And so it's a question even of financial survival for some of these companies. But as we deploy new technologies, we have attempted to assess its dangers before deployment. But with each generation of these texts, we've discovered unforeseen issues. So from the first generation of AI, we now recognize that we face addiction, disinformation, manipulation, 
of opinions, mental health problems, polarization of people, censorship, information overload, and I could go on. You know, and one of the ones that I will show you coming up is what's going on in deep fakes, which with the various bots that are out there are bringing about a breakdown of our democracy. So the next generation AI will cause us to face more mischievous misinformation, more fraud, blackmail, and various new crimes using video and audio fakes. You know, um, they could even get a picture, you know, of your child and put it into porn, you know, or put you into porn and then try to blackmail you. So it's leading to a full collapse of trust in others. And we also just heard about various destabilizations by attacking another country's, let's say their electric grid or breaking into um, their nuclear weapons and causing them to self explode. You know, there's bio weapons and cyber weapons of various kinds that AI actually can help a person discover how to make anthrax, for example. So um, I'm going to give you an example of something that is fairly recently. You can see this image of a person who's wearing these head skulls, as they call them, an M functional MRI. And the functional MRI tied with AI, which says, if these areas of the brain are receiving blood, the person is looking at this, that, and the other thing. And so they had a person look at this image you see on the left, and the AI generated the picture on the right. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Some of you have been worrying about surveillance. So, wow, um, we're all using Wi-Fi. Did you know that if your Wi-Fi router was broken into, that it can be used to create images of the people in the room and make video of what they're doing? Now, it it doesn't see the faces, but it sees the outline and the heat um, aspects, the movements of the person. All of this is bouncing off of us and can be picked up by a device in the room. So AI can now find security vulnerabilities in your router, for example. It can write the Perl code to help it hack in. And for these other things, in a mere three seconds of recorded voice, that's sufficient to create a fake. So a person can record something and then you can play it in the voice of the person that you only got three seconds of their voice. Bands have known this, and this has been available for a couple of years where a band could have Jimi Hendrix play lead guitar for them. And there's another product out there where given things and notes from your loved ones, you can continue ad infinitum to have conversations with your dead ones. You can continue to chat with them. And your answering machine could be used to pick up the three seconds of your voice, or they get your child's voice as they're walking home. Um, you know, and then turn around and do these blackmails and so on. So there's a lot of very serious things to go on here. And another one, you know, is transhumanism. Um, and many of you are quite afraid of what transhumanism may bring. And I am right now intentionally provoking a certain amount of fear. And I want you to remember what I just read about fear and hatred and all. Um, and I want to now steer our thoughts to why transhumanism actually is necessary. 
because when we reach this seventh post-Atlantean cultural age, which has a significant purpose in our human evolution, by the time we get there, puberty will never be reached. Sexual procreation will have ended. And Steiner says at this time, the merging of man and machine will have been solved. It will be a, an important problem, but a kind of merging will have happened. What kind, it's not exactly clear, but he talks in, at length about vibrations from the etheric body causing machinery to work. So what's going to happen? Well, by the year 6000s, as I said, all humans will be infertile. We will hopefully by then have created with the help of our aramonic double and something Steiner called Vulcan beings who are here in our consciousness, just like the spirits in 1879 were driven down into our consciousness. The Vulcan beings are here to balance that. And the harmonic double is seeking to have a body which it can use in the future, a body which is neither born nor dies, a body which has no warmth. So this seventh post-Atlantean cultural age will be the golden age of transhumanism to the end of physical existence. It will be the so-called American cultural age. And it brings this end to physical existence because such bodies will enhance our sense of separation from all other bodies. It'll bring about the sense of extreme egotism. And that will lead to the war of all against all. The wars we're seeing now are not the war of all against all. It is wars in which different groups come together to fight each other. You okay? Okay. Jenny, can you go on mute? It is the course of evolution that everything that is in the higher worlds today descends into the earthly world. Since man is called to help create the external world, he must descend into the physical world with his thoughts, which we have done. We form the world around us. We also form what is in our physicality. Precisely through anthroposophy, people must get a feeling that everything they do, feel, and think in one time continues to have an effect in another time in the future. When people build temples or works of artistic beauty, or even when we create works of statecraft, for the social coexistence of people. These are all things that have significance for the future. What people build today with the help of natural forces will shape the natural products of the future. These materialistic thoughts of human beings that have no reality will become realities as the moon and earth approach reunification. And by the way, that begins around the year 6,000, and the full reunification happens around the year 8,000. From the earth, there will spring forth, I'm quoting Steiner now, a horrible brood of spidery beings. These will join together in an electric web covering the surface of the earth. These spidery beings will have their existence between the mineral and the plant, they don't have full life, and they will operate like automatons. I'm sorry, I didn't get those coming up. <clears throat> so we're just about at the end. You build a church for yourself, not for yourself. You can, in very truth, 
take into yourselves a world of majesty, beauty, and splendor if you experience this world as such. To do something for the higher self does not partake of egotism because it is not done only for the self. The higher self will be united with all others so that what is done for the higher self is at the same time done for all. When the Freemason was working with his fellow builders, he knew this. In future times, the mineral world will be spiritualized. To build means nothing else than to spiritualize the mineral world. He knew that the edifice would one day become the content of his soul. This was the royal art. Now in evolution, we are entering the time to develop the new royal art, which works similarly, but now upon the living, upon the etheric, and this has major social implications. As souls, we spring from, from the world soul. And when this world soul was around us, we drew it into ourselves. So to the spirit, and so too it will be with nature. We take nature into ourselves from outside, and nature will be within us as a power. And what is within us will later be external. What we ourselves prepare to make ready in the world, that is what will constitute our future existence. So I'll quote Paracelsus. When a man looks at the animal world, he should tell himself, I carried all that within myself and I cast it out from my own being. Steiner says something similar. Man has therefore always been man and not an ape. He separated off the whole animal kingdom from himself so that he might become more truly human. You see, as animals were separated, so shall the evil ones be separated from human evolution. And I think that's in the words, deliver us from the evil. The task of evil has been to promote the premature ascent of man. The manure, if we can call it that, from evil allows humanity to attain the highest holiness. Once ascended, the task becomes to help all those who were separated. That is the task of monarchism. In doing this, money will lead those humans who fall with this evil to be brought to an especially high holiness. So this chart is what I try, I've i been leading up to and wanting to get to. So in the fourth post-Atlantean cultural age, the age of the intellectual soul, birth and death were active within us. There was no need for us to become aware of birth and death externally. But now in the fifth post-Atlantean cultural age, the cultural age of the consciousness soul, we must perceive birth and death externally. To this end, we must again develop in ourselves something new. And Stranus says, this is very important. In the fourth post-Atlantean cultural age, we were conscious of birth and death when we looked within ourselves. Today, in order to discover birth and death within, we must first perceive the forces of birth and death externally in the events of history. That is why it is so vitally important that in the cultural age of the consciousness soul, we should have a clear understanding of forces of birth and death in their true sense. And what he's getting at is a knowledge of repeated lives on earth. And now we have to apply the same principle to evil. Just as our consciousness of birth and death has passed from an inner experience to an external realization, so in the fifth post-Atlantean cultural age, we must develop within ourselves something which in the sixth post-Atlantean cultural age will be experienced externally. And of course, that's evil. In the fifth post-Atlantean cultural age, 
evil is destined to develop in us. It will then ray out in the sixth cultural age and be experienced externally, just as birth and death were experienced externally in this fifth cultural age. So Steiner concludes this by saying, evil is destined to develop in the inner being of mankind during this age, only to then move outside into this separation of humanity. What in us can be truly evil? And we find that answer in the second half of the Lord's Prayer, sustained by our daily bread, the physical, karmic debt, the etheric, temptation, the astral, deliver us from ego, evil, that's our ego. Until an individual had attained an ego, can we rightly say the individuals acted with evil? As an example, I'd like to show how the spiritual impulses of two periods, the 4th century and the 13th century, appear as evil. The notable figure of the 4th century, among many, would be Constantine, emperor of Rome. During the 4th century, as Rome ingested Christianity through Constantine, several sacred gospel texts were modified. You can read about that from Bart Ehrman, who's not an anthroposophist. Um, was this the work of evil? Even Paul's letters were modified to change the role of women in the church. Also before the fourth century, the birth of Christ was placed at the baptism. The Gospels read, Today I have begotten thee, Christ as spirit incarnated into the body of Jesus. Both John and Mark thus begin the life of Christ with the baptism. But the other two Gospels, Luke and Matthew, added the description of the birth of Jesus. Each is a different story of different families. So we have two boys, both named Jesus, born not at the same time, months apart. One from Bethlehem goes to Egypt to grow up. The other from Nazareth grows up there. The one in Egypt does come later to Nazareth as well. And I've written a book, um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, painting these two Jesus boys in his Virgin of the Rocks. What did he know about this overcoming of evil? That was a great theme in the, in the amongst the Renaissance artists. Great harm came to Christianity as it was Romanized. But can we call it evil? In the 13th century, let's ask about the completion of the sixth cultural age of the Atlantean epic. Let's look back at that and relate it to the sixth cultural age of our fifth epic. We find that the leaders of the sixth cultural age of Atlantis were Mongols. Near the end of the fourth cultural age of our epic, the Russians suffered greatly at the hands of the Mongols, the Golden Horde. Was their morality still guided by the sixth cultural age of Atlantis? Would this suffering become the basis for the brotherhood of the sixth cultural age? Interestingly, the Mongols also brought to an end Gandhi Shapur that we just heard about. Their sacking of Baghdad in Gandhi Shapur in 1258, as I said, destroyed this culture. That brought the end of the glories of paganism and the ancient mysteries. As you probably know, the spiritual world was closed to mankind in eight years earlier in 1250. This was an intense and dangerous time in human evolution. Christian Rosenkreutz carried humanity through this period, as did the Knights Templar and the Cathars. It is very difficult to look at history and not ask, God, why so much suffering? Of course, humans questioning God is absurd. But for the development of our knowledge of good and evil, asking such questions actually is important. 
We might say about the e evils of the 20th century, how are they different? Was this a fire initiation? Is our consciousness soul maturing? Humanity was able to unite with the earth because when it came down from Eden to earth, the spirits of darkness, which came down with us, laid an adequate foundation for human independence during the time when the laws of heredity, nationality, and race prevailed. What Lucifer and Araman had done became a good thing insofar as humanity was enabled to unite with the earth. You see, therefore, that Lucifer and Araman are servants of the progressive powers, according to Steiner. Now, just as we have separated the animals from our evolutionary path, so will we thrust good and evil out into the world. The good will result in a race of humanity who are naturally good, and the evil will form a separate evil race. We've talked about the fourth, fifth, and sixth cultural ages. And what about that seventh? Well, the seventh cultural age will be when the good and evil right races have separated and manifest in their own way. The good will begin to ascend into the etheric realm. By then, the ideas of transhumanism will have come about. And near the end of this seventh post-Atlantean cultural age, this brood of spidery beings arises. By then, the human form given to us by the Elohim can no longer be maintained. It will have become a spidery form, our harmonic double who wants a body with which it can conquer the physical earth will be leading us towards that goal. Some humans will be unable to leave the physical behind, that is to ascend, and will fall with these aramonic doubles, their double in particular. <clears throat> Some initiates will elect to go with these humans into a separate path of evolution upon that eighth sphere. Redemption can come when Jupiter recapitulates Earth. Redemption will be for not only the fallen humans, but for Araman as well. This is the mission Mani has taken on. This will be a different path than the human path of evolution, just as animals are on a different path. And I must say, we are not alone. Besides us, all spiritual beings are evolving. It is selfish on our part to consider only human evolution. Although our evolution is center stage, I've mentioned the new royal art, the spiritualizing of the living, working upon the etheric realm where Christ is showing us today the way. The hierarchy seeks redemption of the laggards from the prior planetary conditions. Lazarus John seeks the redemption of Cain. And in our times, begins the preparation for those who will be on the human stage of Jupiter. We will be their angels. We will need to be able to incarnate into their bodies in order to help guide them. What kind of lowest bodily member will Jupiter humans have? So this is just a review. You can see in this timeline when ascension begins when we will have these new physical bodies that will come to us out of transhumanism and when these various time frames will occur. So I'll just ask <clears throat> I, as a sort of recapitulation of this, what is the point of our divinely planned evolution? Did we come here to glorify God or to live happily or become something we're not yet? 
is evolution only for us humans or for more than just us? As I said, we're not here alone. We've worked hard for our freedom, but in the future, we will take on duty. Duty? You're kidding. Duty applies only to the military, right? Thy will will be done. It is no longer a question of invoking spiritual beings to do the work for us. We have all the tools we need. It is our cosmic duty that we will the future. Thy will will be done. We mere mortals must begin to do immortal deeds. And I'll quote Steiner to close here. Yet we must be clear that what seems to be hindrance and destruction is in the long run again membered into the wisdom of the whole system. One might therefore say, when something apparently destructive, retarding, and evil exists anywhere, then evolution in its whole course will be so wisely guided that even this evil, this destruction, this hindrance will be reversed and changed into the good, end quote. Likewise, we must come to realize that we are not here for ourselves alone. We are here for the sake of the universe and all of its beings. So with that, I'd like to open this up um, to your questions. And by the way, are there any treats left in that Halloween bowl? So, Andre, back to you. Yeah. Andre, thank you so much for your super intense uh, presentation, as usual. Uh, I see uh, Richard already raising his hand. Yeah, but I'm wondering if we can take uh, two, three minutes of restroom or sip of water break. Sure. Yes. And uh, you can restore your voice. Also have a, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we will be back in three minutes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, friends. We almost fall back, so waiting just for Valdemar. So, <laughs> okay, Sony is here. Valdemar is still coming. Um, all right, dear friends. So, uh, Okay, Richard uh, is raising hand, but you know, guys, it's uh, it's a way to raise your electronic hand. So just a reminder. Uh, 
uh, go on reaction in the bottom of your screen and uh, and uh, uh, click on raise hand. So gotta be an unmute. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Richard is first. Richard, go ahead. Okay. So this is a practical solution. So if you look on what's going on with Israel and Gaza, okay, you know, it's one thing, you know, to say that, well, these, these are the Azores, okay, negative forces just, you know, you know, wanting to destroy, okay, as I say, and this, this may be a consequence of something that's coming down from the spiritual world, but from a practical standpoint, what can I do as an individual? I think that there is a group that does uh, uh, a hallelujah eurythmically at I, on Eastern time. It would be, I think, at 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. or something like that. But that's just a practical question how we as individuals can do something to help mitigate that situation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Okay, uh, dear friends, any questions or uh, statements? Now you're unmuted temporarily. Are we unmuted? Yes, you are. Would you okay. like to ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the only thing, at least from my own standpoint, the only thing that I feel that I can do because so much of this evil is is out of our control in a certain sense, mm -hmm. is to uh, practice Christianity. I think it was Augustine who said that if there's anything good in the world, it's Christ-based. And uh, we have all of us as Christians, uh, I, would, I would call us Christians in name only. I mean, do we really practice Christianity? To practice Christianity is about all that I feel that I can do. And that is to love one another, to forgive, to love your enemies as well as your friends. So how do you love a Hitler or a Stalin or even a Trump? I mean, I, I pose this question to myself. And I've come to an understanding as to how I could you know, love a, a Hitler. I don't have to agree with a vicious character, but I can love him as a human being. And that's what we have to learn to do. That's all we can do. I can't do anything about the situation in Israel, at least I, other than what I can do towards Christianity. Because Christ, if we follow him in practice, not just in name only, but in practice, then I think that's what we can do to uh, improve our own situation and the situation around us. Now, what I found interesting looking in the internet, this was a, 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 a research done by the Pew organization and they claim that one in three Americans believe in repeated Earth lives. Right, 34%. Now, if case, yeah, if that's the case, there's over 100 million Americans uh, uh, that believe in repeated Earth lives. But because there's nothing distinct said about previous Earth lives in the Bible, religion can't do anything with it. Because all they can do is read the Bible, and then guess what it means. Because we know that a lot of the Bible is oriented toward the spirit, not necessarily towards earth language. So, I mean, how do you address these people? They, they're they not getting any help anywhere other than they believe in repeated earth lives. Now, look what repeated, the knowledge of repeated earth lives, look what it do with some of our problems. Racism would not exist because I could have been a different color in a previous life or in a future life. Uh, sexism, I mean, I could be female or male in the next life. I mean, it sort of uh, brings us together. Uh, 
by you know understanding that we are beings with that have come from previous lives and will go into future lives. So <laughs> thank you. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, so dear friends, uh, more questions or statements. Okay, Valdemar. You're on mute. You're on mute, Valdemar. Oh, yeah, mute your machine, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, I have a, two questions uh -oh. and a statement. First is a personal question. Were you reading notes? You were so sure of, of what you were saying and so logical, so, you know, so uh, clear. Second, remember when I gave my lecture, eventually here or at uh, Mystic, I said that transhumanism would require, um, uh, let's suppose that transhumanism comes with a connection to digital machines, okay? In this case, we should know what the code interpreted by the brain is. We should know this code. This code does not, is not known now. And I have a very strong hypothesis that it doesn't exist. Steiner says that uh, our thinking, our nervous activity, happen in a cer certain void in our nerves. I don't, uh, I don't know if you know about that. So there is no code uh, in our brain. So it will be impossible to download our brain into a computer, into a digital machine or upload from the digital machine into ourselves. So uh, there will be a connection. There is already a connection. People are making connections, but detecting uh, electrical uh, impulses that uh, nobody knows what, why they are generated uh, and, uh, and so on, right? Let me stop you for just a second. Yes, well, yes. Transhumanism, I did not mean this movement of consciousness into digital. Um, I meant that we would have a machine like a prosthetic limb that you could control by your thought impulse. And we actually already have this today. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. And that's what I meant by um, what transhumanism, that part of transhumanism that seeks to replace what in your body is uh, frail and defective compared to what could be a mechanical. Yes, but uh, uh, in this case, it's a very limited uh, transhumanism. It's just improving our uh, strength, right? right. Uh, uh, I was thinking another kind of transhumanism is what people are talking about, uh, downloading the brain and uploading the machine into the brain. And I, I think this will be impossible if my hypothesis is correct. That there is no code in our brain, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, second, uh, about the question what to do, I think the only way for humanity, for humankind, to improve is to understand what the human being is. That's the beginning of anthroposophy, right? Understanding what the human being is. Without understanding that humans have a spirit self, an, uh, an I, 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 I like to call it the I, you know, translating from the German I. Uh, we have an I that is spiritual, has no sex, no nationality, and so on and so forth. And uh, I think um, we should educate uh, young people so that uh, they may get to this idea that uh, humans have a spirit. And this is not being done nowadays. Education educates to materialism, right? Mm -hmm. Forces, education nowadays forces intellectualism, abstraction, you know, and uh, materialism. 
Yeah. And uh, and uh, I think, uh, and, and here we come to a very, very uh, problematic point, uh, Andrew. Only anthroposophy gives these uh, uh, whole view of, of human being, of the human being. Only anthroposophies, anthroposophy d d gives that. Uh, there are religions, mysticism, and so on, but they never get to the understanding that we have through anthroposophy. So this is a very difficult situation. We are the owners of the truth. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very, very difficult for us, anthroposophists, and for anthroposophy. I think it's the only way. Uh, only Steiner gave uh, the uh, conception of a human being that is necessary to respect it, to respect the human being, to dignify the human being, to respect uh, humans' freedom, for instance. From matter, freedom cannot arise. Uh, somebody that is, that is materialist should not praise freedom because matter has no freedom whatsoever, right? So uh, this is this is a big, a very, very difficult. We are in a very, in very difficult times. And uh, for instance, in the Middle East, I see no way out of that war, no way out. You know, you cannot deal with fanat fanaticism on both sides, right? Uh, how can you solve something if uh, people involved uh, in that thing are fanatics? Uh, Christ said that if you are hit in one face, you should give the other face, right? That's beautiful, but it only works if the other person that is attacking you is mental health, uh, how to say, healthy, mental healthy. If the other person is not mental healthy, if you give the other face, he will, he will, uh, you know, use a use a knife and and, and attack you <laughs> it's a big problem right i'm sorry for all that well let me just mention in case people don't know valdemar uh has been a professor of computer science and um at sao paulo university in brazil and yes. uh we're uh typically always on the same page, singing the same hymn when we're <laughs> speaking at these conferences and all. So it's, it's wonderful to have you here and as support. Oh, thank you. I'm going to move on hey, to Susan. Uh, uh, Andrew, in your response uh, to Voldemars, no? <laughs> no, I, I, other than to say I, he's right on. I agree. <laughs> okay. okay, Suzanne, please. Yeah, Suzanne, please unmute your machine first. No, unmute your machine first. Uh-huh. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to know um, what would all these changes that you talked about in terms of evolution, will this be made on the earth? I suppose so. And what what kind of uh, how what kind of uh, earth will that will that be because it's not in a good shape right now right so um this gets very difficult to try to give a picture but if you were to ask your grandparents if they could see the world you live in now would they say it's got it's much worse than the one that we lived in? And yet you wouldn't want to go back and live in their world that they lived in. And the kids that are being born today, they, as they are coming to incarnation, are preparing their karma, they're preparing their life bodies and so on. Um, they have a picture of what they're coming into. And I mean, even Goethe, Steiner had a thing. If you met Goethe, you wouldn't have liked him. <laughs> uh, it, because of he would have been behaving in a way appropriate for that time. And he talks about 
in his time, Snyder's time, the generation gaps that were going on. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something that happens in a new generation that kind of says, I don't care if you think this is worse. This is the world I'm born into. This is the world I'm going to take up. And in a way, we have to stop judging the world that we're passing on. It's We need to do as good a job to pass on what we can. This gets into all those questions of climate change and all. Yeah, we were probably quite stupid about some of the things we've done. Um, but they're done, you know, and um, and what's going to happen in with technology and all, um, you know, I hate to put it this way, I don't think you've seen anything yet. As we approach Araman's incarnation, which I put after Mikael's reign is over, mm -hmm. I think he's got a lot going on right now to prepare. And for those of us who are over 70, this might be very scary, but for somebody that's 20, no big deal. I see, yeah, I see. I think they can handle it. I And, and, it, and I say that out of this, um, you know, expression that God will never allow us to be tempted beyond our capability. And I meant to sort of roll some of that in to say, we actually have the capabilities. We just don't know that we have them. Mm -hmm. We do have the capabilities with uh, what of what? Of, of counterbalance what counter we bring about what we need to counterbalance so that it's not a matter of being healthy in the old sense of being healthy. It's it's a there's a new sense yeah. that's coming with each generation. I see. And yeah, so it's following the path of evolution and actually helping to bring about what needs to come, even if it seems to bring about an end to what you have felt to be wonderful and dear to you yeah, yeah. yeah there's a lot of trust <laughs> we have to have a lot of trust yes in the spiritual world yeah yeah thank you as we're moving on to the next there's that there's a wonderful verse that's attributed to steiner um that i think fw zelman von eschen wrote but nobody knows for sure about uh begins we must eradicate all fear of the future i don't know if you know that verse but no. it's if you look up those words do a google search i'm sure it'll come up rudolf steiner we must eradicate all fear and and trust <laughs> right well it's building trust in the future but yeah yeah Difficult, yeah. Difficult it is. Yeah. This was spoken by Steiner in a lecture that was not uh, recorded, not uh, transcribed, right? And only from notes afterwards. Uh, I have the, the original in, in German. Uh, I'm going to send you, Andrew. Uh, I, I have it in English. Oh, great. I just put it in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. The whole thing. <laughs> So you can copy it, Suzanne, out of chat. Do you know how to do that? You just no. Oh, slide your cursor. Yeah. Open, click on the beginning and slide your cursor down to the end. It will highlight it all. To and chat? No, no. Yeah. Open chat. The chat window. Okay. Okay. I see it. Right, and then you can also yeah. save all chat by going to the bottom of the chat window and clicking on the three little dots. Right. So, and it brings up save chat. And at the end of the meeting, uh, you'll find all the chat in a folder on your computer. Okay. How about that? That's thank question. you, Sandra. Yeah. Okay. okay. So thank, thank you, you so much. Um, thank so you. Nisha is next. Hello, Nisha. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for a wonderful presentation again. Um, 
I, I wanted to ask one thing is, is it possible that when Rudolf Steiner was alive, he saw into our time and the future and various visuals came through to him, which he then spoke about, he then left. And at this point in time, other human beings have come through and that whatever then Steiner had possibly seen may have changed. Is that possible? I, I'm not going to say it's not possible. Um, there are certain things where, um, you know, I, I talked about these streams that bring things to the surface where they happen. Um, and those streams, a, a stream can cause something to come later or whatever, or never occur. Um, but, you know, it will influence, but it, you'll never get it happening in, in the way it was meant to happen. Um, but there's certain things which I think we can also say are a necessity. And Steiner talks, if you do a search in RS Archive for the word, the phrase iron necessity, he speaks about a number of things that, that absolutely must occur. And they must occur by a certain date. And some of those are like the return of the moon and the war of all against all and the end of our existence in the physical realm. Those sort of things are our iron necessity. Um, the outcome of a given war, I don't know if that's part of iron necessity. Um, but I, I will say that Steiner talked about machines that will have a remarkably amazing intelligence, but an aramonic intelligence. And this is something I think we're seeing today. Machines with these this intelligence that's aramonic. Thank you. Um, one other thing. Have yeah. you read the article by Jonathan Hilton? I have tried to, I will put it this way. I'm just beginning to branch out from Steiner to read other people. Right. But, uh, for the last 40 see. years, I stuck with, I didn't read Waxmuth. I didn't read, yeah, I just read Steiner because I felt Kovyev, all the others, when I started reading them, brought a different picture. And I felt I, I, I was getting more confused and if I just stuck with Steiner. So I just, I did that. And it's only recently, so. I, I just mentioned it because he's yeah. speaking about Pluto, which is this nuclear force that came up in your presentation of destructive tendencies, shadow side, underworld. Yeah. Like I, I don't know if you know the name Carl Unger, but he for many years, was wondering if the third force that Steiner talked about, electricity, magnetism, being the first two as polar opposites, respectively, of light and the chemical ether, light ether and the chemical ether, electricity, magnetism, and that there would be a polar opposite of the life ether. And he said, this is very dangerous. He doesn't want to say anything about it because he says he hopes humanity will have reached a level of moral fortitude by that time frame, because it can be used in horribly destructive ways. And many in anthroposophists wondered if that was nuclear power and the nuclear weapons. Um, and Unger starts with that in his career and ends up thinking, no, it's probably something beyond that. We might include it in it, but he felt it was something that we had not yet reached, luckily. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, you're next, I think, if I can. Yeah, please. Yes, I think it's me next. And the only reason for my comment now is that I feel very uncomfortable with something that Valdemar said, 
uh, a little while ago. And I'm referring to the fact that we are the ones holding the truth. It makes me uncomfortable because I truly believe that anyone on earth that authentically follows their religion, whatever that is, has the same claim as we assume we have. I cannot possibly believe that we are the only ones that can claim to be the authentical personification of the truth. I, it would mean for me personally, betraying the belief that there is good in every human being. That's why it makes me uncomfortable. And I just felt the need to say it. Thank you. Thank you, Yaya. Um, I don't know, Valdemar, if you want to respond in any way. I don't know if that's quite what you meant by holding the truth, but go ahead and if you wanted to say Yes, I meant understanding. Loving is not understanding, you know, through reason. I said we, through anthroposophy, can understand what a human being is. Feeling what a human being is can be quite positive, right? But it's not understanding. And I said, the, my statement presented a problem for each one of us and for anthroposophy. Hope that helps. We'll go yes, on. it does. Mm -hmm. um, but still, we shouldn't. I mean, I, I, I do understand fully the importance and relevance, especially in our time, of a, a, a wider understanding as you, as you call it, and I share this this point with you entirely, but we shouldn't really forget the other side, which is the love of towards humanity as a whole. Um, I, I just felt the need to to underline this point. I'm, I'm, I'm didn't mean to be uh, disrespectful or or, or anything. But you're like not. That. Yeah, yeah. That and I understand your point. And I and I appreciate that you brought it up because this love for humanity is our goal. And and I think what Valdemar is trying to say is though to come to understand the human being, developing that wisdom leads us then to being able to love the human being. So thank you both. Yeah. Let's go on to Dick. Yes. Oh, hi. Number one, I uh, I, I agree with the I, uh, the Werner Glass that you have to meet people where they are spiritually. Number one. Number two, in regard to our age, there's a great line from West Side Story. And we, with these young young kids are around the pharmacist and he says, when I was your age, he says, when you were my age, when your father my, was my age, when my grandfather was my age, you were never my age. None of you. And the sooner you understand that, the better off you could be able to understand us. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. Thank you. As always, I love your humor. All right. Great. Leon. Hi, everyone, and uh, thanks for another great talk, Andrew. Um, gosh, I want to ent enter into this conversation a little bit before I ask my question. Um, <sighs> You know, understanding is great, but like one of my teachers told me, it's the booby prize. It's still not knowing. I'm a scientist. I've been a scientist since the 60s. Been working with computers since the 60s as, you know, tools for research. So, you know, I also, when I came to the States soon, I got acquainted with the yippie statement that you began your talk with. All isms should be wasms. So, 
So let's be careful we don't start anthroposophism, folks. And I'll just move on to my question because it's also based on what is the truth. Now, my question is, you raised climate change. I think and uh, goodness me, I've been, you know, an environmental scientist for many years. Um, I've been in and out of that. And it's causing us a lot of difficulty, especially in relation to our world's enemies. And uh, I've never been able to find anything in Steiner about climate change. So if it's such an existential problem, why didn't he tell us about it? <laughs> okay, I think we should not go into the climate change issue here. I think you've made a good point, Leon, and um, I'm gonna turn this back to the host to uh, bring us to a wonderful close. I appreciate the wasms and all the humor, Dick and Leon and everyone else. Yeah. Um, thank you, dear friends. So we're working already uh, one hour and 50 minutes. So right. and I'm wondering if a good time to finish and say thank you to Andrew. Um, so dear friends, so uh, we have very intense uh, program for next five or six weeks. So mm -hmm. please stay tuned. Next year, we will welcome as guest speaker uh, Eugene Schwartz and uh, Leland Harris and Alison Meredith after him. So, but every single week we have very significant uh, presentations. So please join us. So dear Andrew, thank you so much for your super intense as usual presentation. And uh, dear friends, if you would like to unmute your machines and say thank you personally, please do so. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Andre. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Andre. Thanks, Andre. Brilliant. Thank you, Andre and, and uh, Andrew <laughs> and everyone who contributed. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you all. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, there, take care, friends. I'm ending the meeting. Yeah, Thank meeting. you all. Bye. Bye. See you, Florian.